Hey Maria, I understand you'll be recording this call? Yes, Hello? I am. Yes, Can I am. Can you guys hear me? Yago, there's something wrong with your mic. Or internet connection. You sound like a robot in slow motion. Can you guys hear me now? It's good now. It's good now. Yes, it's good now. Okay, great. Le Marie, I understand you'll be recording the call? Yes, I am. Okay, so you've already started. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, we're calling this governance call today to discuss uh, zero with a goal to propose that we significantly increase the origination fee. Uh, uh, with the goal of significantly or effectively totally curtailing new uh, zero borrowing for now. I've posted to the forum on this uh, matter and um, I'd like to provide some context and rationale. So I'll start by sharing my screen. So looking at uh, the zero analytics, we can see that the origination fee and the redemption fee are still hovering somewhat above their base level, which means that we are still seeing some level of redemptions. And if we look at redemptions, we can see that while there are, there appears to be a reduction in the amount of redemptions. Yes? Uh, sorry, we don't see your screen. Oh, does it no one see load. it is loading, but it hasn't actually loaded. Okay, um, it appears I may be having some issue. Instead of me trying to correct this live, um, can someone else uh, share their screen? Uh, I, perhaps one digit, you could look, uh, help sh uh, provide the screen share for the Zero Analytics dashboard. Can you guys see one digit screen? Yeah. Yes. I'm I'm unable to maybe yes. Yes, we see it. We see it. Okay, great. Uh, I'm unable to. Uh, <laughs> but um, okay, I'm unable to see. Oh, wait a minute. No, I, for whatever reason, it's not displaying to me, which is probably some kind of Discord issue. In any event, um, as you guys uh, are able to see through one digit screen or via your own, I will continue to speak through this. So, if we look at redemptions over the last 30 days, we see that redemptions have continued. And while we have periods of relatively minimal redemptions, um, we do have spiky periods where there are significant amounts of redemptions. The last was uh, mid to July. We're also seeing that there is continued originations. And so the, there's a, a um, this balance scenario here where continued originations introduce an overhang, which is ultimately balanced out by redemptions. This 
is um, less than favorable. We want to reduce redemptions to a minimum so that those who use zero and um, create lines of credit can feel confident that their line of credit will remain in the form of Bitcoin. As of now, if you look at the TCR, so the total collateral ratio, we see that the total collateral ratio is 322%, which is high. And it is driven at least to a great extent. Sorry? Sorry, John, I couldn't make out what you said. Nobody said anything. Okay. Um, so we can see that uh, the um, TCR of 322% um, has risen um, as, as redemptions became more of a factor. And there's the issue where no matter how high your collateralization ratio, you're in a red queen race. You're effectively racing against other people. And so even very high collateral ratio positions can be redeemed against. Um, one digit, if you could also now show the um, dashboard for the sovereign dollar, specifically the dollar sovereign dollar peg. Got it. So the sovereign dollar peg has improved, but still remains not entirely stable. Uh, we still see dips below 98 cents. Uh, and indeed, um, in the beginning of July, we even saw a dip below, briefly below 96 cents, depending uh, on what you're comparing to. In this particular instance, I'm comparing to dollar on chain. Um, so there is a difference between a sovereign dollar versus XUSD and dollar on chain and RUSDT, but in all cases, while we are sometimes above the dollar peg, we tend to more typically be around 1% below the peg, which is where the redemptions start to make economic sense. Now, um, the uh, zero product continues to provide revenue, primarily in the form of originations, but also in the form of redemptions. And so, this is a, a powerful product, and we, we had strong reason to believe it would be a powerful product. But as we've discussed many times, we are dealing with a two-sided market where you have the users of zero who are the borrowers and effectively issue into existence new sovereign dollar. And then we have the other side of the market, which is sovereign dollar holders. Now, the sovereign dollar itself can be an extremely compelling product. It is the most decentralized and robust stablecoin um, and it is collateralized by bitcoin um, and indeed it has grown to be the biggest bitcoin backed stablecoin and we've seen robust growth of it primarily driven by users of zero and it is not an unusual situ situation to have a two-sided market um, this is very typical in the digital realm um, you know, anything from businesses like Uber to Amazon to, um, you know, uh, Deliveroo, um, um, Airbnb, all of these represent two-sided markets. And there are also well-worn strategies to um, build two-sided markets. One thing which is... Uh, almost always the case in a two-sided market is one side of the market is much more difficult to build than the other. In our case, zero is easy to build. In other words, the issuance of sovereign dollars is relatively easy. The growth of holders and demand to be holders of sovereign dollar is more difficult. And this is because sovereign dollar itself requires some degree of network effect. It is a currency and it becomes vastly more useful as more people um, have hold it are willing to accept it and it is integrated into more economic value. In other words, into more applications, into more products, etc. And we are in a situation where uh, we're growing both sides of the market, but the growth of the sovereign dollar side is lagging the growth of zero. 
Now, um, that is the high level context, and I'd like to provide some more detailed context around the growth of sovereign dollar demand. Typically speaking, when you're looking to grow a um, two-sided market, there are a few things which are considered best practice. One is you try to establish a niche market where the more difficult side of the market is particularly attractive. In the case of the sovereign dollar, that is the sovereign ecosystem. And also, uh, uh, stablecoin holders um, or companies that are looking for an alternative to stablecoins and the dollar. In other words, dollars held in a bank. Um, and in terms of growing that niche, we have to a degree saturated the, the, the growth that we can have in the niche ecosystem of sovereign. And so we should, exceed, should expect to see additional growth as we grow sovereign. Um, with regards to um, additional niche markets, well, we had our first, first company take sovereign dollars as a treasury asset, and we would like to grow that uh, opportunity and see both them add more sovereign dollars to their treasury and others begin to do the same thing. And we can look for additional um, market opportunities. Um, in all of these cases, growing the sovereign ecosystem, growing the um, participants uh, who hold sovereign dollars as a treasury or a savings asset, and growing the use cases for sovereign dollar, we require connective tissue. We, we need sovereign to be more connected to other types of economic ecosystems. And that requires uh, partners and it requires bridging. And some examples of this are the um, integration with uh, a number of uh, wallets, most uh, substantially perhaps um, Exodus, which represents um, a form of connective tissue and opens us up to a broader audience. And then things like bridges, where um, we have been working to introduce additional bridges into the system. And then um, tying these things together is Babelfish incentive curves. Now, where we stand right now is that we are progressing on all of these fronts. Uh, tomorrow, there is a call with um, Babelfish in which I will participate, in which there is a decision about a go, no go decision around launching the incentive curves. And I think that the likelihood that the decision to launch is quite high. Um, we have um, been working to integrate with Exodus and other wallets and deepen the integration with Exodus. We have DAP 2.0 um, improving rapidly and will improve rapidly over the next two months, which will make um, the UI easier both for people who are integrating with Sovereign and for new users. And we expect to have new popular and significant bridges available around September. And so there is a gap of uh, several months before these things come to fruition. And then at the same time, um, we are having conversations with a number of Bitcoin companies around adding sovereign dollar to their treasury. Um, we expect to see some movement on that front uh, based on what they're telling us over the coming weeks. Um, initially, they will take small positions, but as they grow confidence, um, we expect those positions to grow and that will also provide confidence to others to do the same thing. For that confidence to grow, uh, we would like to see uh, a very stable sovereign dollar, which is trading closely and tightly with the peg. We would like to see more opportunities to earn yield on the sovereign dollar and the way that yield uh, can be earned more easily on the sovereign dollar is if there's more scarcity around the sovereign dollar. So, for example, people would be looking to borrow sovereign dollar rather than issue it into existence. And um, we want to be focused <coughs> and have the people who are working on the protocol focused on delivering their connective tissue 
rather than distracted by other things. And if we see continued redemptions, then zero continues to act as something of a distraction over that period of time. Um, so I was talking about strategies uh, for growing a two-sided market. So one part of the strategy is that niche market and you want to be able to grow that niche market. But what has become common practice as well is subsidies. Um, Uber subsidized uh, riders, um, Airbnb subsidized um, uh, hosts, um, and um, most uh, uh, protocols and projects in the crypto space subsidize with their token. So right now, um, we are not finding our subsidies to be as effective as they should be. And we can point to this in two ways. One, um, we haven't seen, despite the subsidy being provided to um, the stability pool, we haven't seen um, growth in the participation in the stability pool. And another indication of this is despite the fact that revenue for stakers of the SOV has increased substantially, we haven't seen uh, um, the market respond in, by acquiring more SOV in order to stake and earn that yield. And so I think a lot of this comes down to the connective tissue, the ability to bring in new audiences. And what this, I think, says to us is that these efforts are likely to be less effective until such time as we have the connective tissue, which allows us to bring new participants and new users to the system. All of this is to say that um, in the short term, uh, and by short term, I mean the coming weeks, perhaps the coming two, maybe three months, uh, we will struggle to see significant growth in um, demand for sovereign dollar. And so we will not see the growth in the demand for that side of the market reach parity uh, with a continue, continuously growing um, zero. And so what we therefore should do, and this is the, what the, the point that we're putting forward to consideration, is halt the growth of zero for now, which means no further originations, no additional issuance of sovereign dollar, to give us time without distraction to build confidence for those who are looking at the sovereign dollar in its peg, uh, for those who are holding locks to continue to hold their locks, and for the uh, community and the team to focus uh, all of their efforts without distraction on growing demand for the sovereign dollar. Because the sovereign dollar, because zero is a permissionless system, it is not something that we can turn on and off. Uh, without very significant smart contract changes. And so therefore, uh, what I'm proposing today is that we instead increase the origination fee very significantly. How significantly? I'm proposing that we increase the origination fee to 1,000%. Uh, a 1,000% origination fee should be very dissuasive. In other words, it should dissuade users from creating new sovereign dollars. And I would propose that we do this until we start seeing all of the, not all, but a significant element of growth in the sovereign dollar and um, the efforts that are currently um, being taken bearing fruit. More connectivity, more bridging, um, release of DEP 2.0, deeper integration into it, Exodus, um, and um, positive conversations, which are actually turning into acquisition of sovereign dollar by uh, additional parties. On chain, what we should see is some scarcity in sovereign dollar. We should see the sovereign dollar more frequently trading above peg uh, and in general trading closer to peg, probably more uh, borrowing of sovereign dollar and um, as a result, a more attractive lending opportunity for sovereign dollar. I'd like to address two potential concerns that I have around these and how I'm thinking about them, and then I'd like to open it up to discussion. One concern is around protocol revenue. 
origination fees currently represent the largest chunk of uh, protocol revenue and the second largest chunk is redemption fees so we can expect to see if we do this um, protocol revenue drop significantly for the period my view is that this is um, exactly what we should do from a long-term approach we want to build confidence in the products rather than trying to milk them in a way which is effectively cannibalizing them for the long term. The second concern is reputational. Uh, will this negatively impact Sovereign's reputation or negatively impact Zero's reputation? And I think it's exactly the opposite. I think this will help burnish our reputation um, as a community <coughs> in terms of placing um, user safety and sound finance above uh, short-term uh, growth objectives while at the same time protecting the existing lines of credit, which will um, not be impacted by higher fees, but will likely see lower redemption rates. Um, I recognize that the 1000% origination fee can sound startling. Um, uh, and so I think now might be, a, on, and on that note, might be a good uh, opportunity to open this to the floor. I think it's worth noting that although this isn't part of the uh, proposal, um, at least uh, I don't think it is since the last time I reviewed the draft, um, the front end team is uh, preparing to disable borrowing in the front end so that no users um, inadvertently borrow at such a high interest rate. and generally to signal that um, borrowing is not encouraged. Um, so th most users will never even see 1000% origination fee in the front end. Um, the only way that they could even uh, experience such a high origination fee is if if they were to interact directly with the smart contract to borrow ZUSD. Hey, I have a question for Yago. This is Travis. Shoot, Travis. Hey, um, how long did you say you think that we should be doing this, having the origination fee super high? Did you say until we have these future partnerships set up? I think bottom line, what we would like to see is consistent growth in demand for sovereign dollar. We would like to see that the sovereign dollar demand is growing. Um, the indicators that we can use for that uh, on chain are um, more a, a tighter peg, fewer redemptions, um, possibly even the sovereign dollar trading more occasionally above par and likely secondary indicators would be uh, more borrowing um, uh, and lending of sovereign dollar as well as more conversions of other stable coins into sovereign dollar most likely via uh, Babelfish. Um, I think there are also soft indications. So yes, other parties uh, adding sovereign dollar to their treasury would be a contributing factor. Uh, seeing more sovereign dollars held in wallets, particularly probably wallets that are trading on sovereign. Um, uh, those are the indicators that we would want to see. So we'd want to see growth and we would want to have a sense that this growth um, is um, sustainable. In other words, that it is likely to persist. Now, part of the reason that I would like to make this proposal now rather than at a different time is because I think we, um, we're in a position to see that happen over the coming months. So um, I think our strategy and the conversation would be very different if we had um, a much more difficult problem on our hands. If we didn't 
see a path uh, to growing demand for sovereign data. That is not the situation. Um, and so what I would like, um, the way I, I'm thinking about this and the reason I'm making this proposal is because what I would like to see is us stabilize zero and the sovereign dollar in preparation for the, and, and effectively as a setup for what I believe in two or three months could be the beginning of uh, more consistent growth in sovereign dollar demand. So I kind of have a follow-up question up on that then. Um, obviously, zero users have complained mostly about the um, being redeemed against on their lines of credit. And if we know that we're going to be raising um, the origination fee or, or whatever super high um, and offering that protection on future lines of credit or those who already have lines of credit, I know that the whole point of this is to soak up demand for current um, dollars, but maybe it could also be a good opportunity to create a little bit more revenue uh, for sovereign stakers. If we incentivize people, if you open up a line of credit now, then you have a far less likely chance of being redeemed against in the future. Um, I don't know, just spitballing here. Thank you, Travis. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would like to see this SIP um, begin voting tomorrow, which is an accelerated pace relative to what we would usually do. The reason I would like to do that is because I don't want there to be a lot of discussion around this uh, or a period of uncertainty and discussion around this where people think, okay, now is a good time to open a line of credit because it's going to get more expensive in the future. We would like to avoid that scenario because ideally um, we wouldn't see a significant wave of new sovereign dollar issuance um, for exactly the same reason that we would like to limit sovereign dollar issuance in the future, right? Until such time as we're seeing growth in the demand for the sovereign dollar. Um, so, um, I would actually say that my approach is exactly the opposite of yours. I, I would like for us to uh, immediately or as soon as possible curtail uh, any further growth in sovereign dollar issuance. Hi, this is um, T-Bone. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems to me that if we don't want to issue any new dollars, sovereign dollars through origination, originating new sovereign dollars, that um, we need to have some place to put those sovereign dollars. As of now, it seems like the lending pool for sovereign dollars is completely broken. Like that isn't even an option. So people can't borrow sovereign dollars any other way than to issue new ones into existence. There's no place to borrow them from. Um, and you can't oh, even. T-Bone, just, just before you continue, can you explain what you mean by it's completely broken? The well, lending pool. The pool. The lending pool, as of now, on the UI, it doesn't have any interest to the people who pool. So it it not so keeps getting smaller. A couple of weeks ago, it was like ten thousand or so. Now it's like four thousand. And I'm sure people are looking at it saying, well, I'm not getting any interest. Why is my money, my dollars just sitting here? And then I guess either going to try and do something else with the ability pool or come back in the, the BTC. Now, even you can't even put a lot of dollars in the pool. 
down to percent or one percent. So that doesn't that doesn't yes. Yes. Okay. So sorry. Uh, let me just ask quickly: Can everyone hear T Bone? Because for me, he's cutting in and out. Cutting in and out. Okay, uh, T Bone. Yeah. Let me uh, let me let me respond quickly to what I understood as part of what you were saying. So you you were saying that there isn't a lot of sovereign dollars in the lending pool, which is true. This is a problem, right? What we would like to see is more sovereign dollars in the lending pool, so that people, because right now, for example, if you place sovereign dollars in the lending pool, you're, you're earning seven point three percent, which is high. Uh, by any measure, um, the uh, r reason for that is that the, all of the assets in the lending pool are currently borrowed. Uh, we would like to see additional sovereign dollars in that pool um, with, you know, that supply APY should be attractive to people depositing in that pool. And we should expect to see growth in in deposits of sovereign dollar and people can use that as a savings account so for you know anyone who has dollars can um, effectively right now earn interest on those dollars by um, having those dollars in the form of sovereign dollar in other words converting or holding sovereign dollar and placing them in the lending pool we're not seeing enough users taking advantage of this and um, this might be a a, a, a question of education. It might be a question of the actual availability of sovereign dollars circulating. Um, but uh, that's exactly the kind of metric that we want to be looking at. Well, the lending pool for dollars, even though it's at 7% interest, as soon as you put another $1,000 in there, it will go down to maybe 5% interest. So if I was to put 30,000 in there, it would practically be no interest. So that's why I say it doesn't seem to be a viable option. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, it makes perfect sense what you're saying, but um, uh, it's true that the lending has to come first, right? So people need to lend first, but we know that there is demand to borrow dollars. We see this in originations, right? Originations are at five percent. So, on a fixed interest basis, people should be at least willing to borrow at five percent interest uh, from the fixed lending pool. Um, you know, to a first approximation. Of course, there are longer, you know, people who are you know looking to hold their line of credit for longer periods of time. But you know, to a first approximation. 5% or 6% interest should be sustainable within the lending pool. Now, of course, people aren't going to borrow from the lending pool unless there are assets available to borrow. So there is right. no so to, 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 to fix this uh, chicken and egg problem. Um, has the circle of tokens uh, looked at this and considered uh, shifting around some of the subsidies to try to address this uh, clear imbalance? Uh, I can't speak for the circle of tokens, but um, from my perspective, I think there are a couple of things that we could do. One is Exchequer could deposit some, so Exchequer holds on its balance sheet sovereign dollars. Part of those could be deposited into the lending pool. One of the reasons that Exchequer hasn't done this up until now was in order to provide space for people who are holding sovereign dollars to do it and for them to be the primary beneficiaries of, of borrowing. Um, Beyond that, yes, um, there uh, I, I would be um, and have you know been talking primarily to people on the adoption team about um, providing some kind of subsidy to lenders. Um, so you know, in terms of the chicken and egg problem, we can subsidize lending early on, uh, create a base of capital which people can borrow, and then focus on growing the borrowing. Iago, also on the UI for the um, lending of sovereign dollars, even though you have 
contributed to the lending pool for sovereign dollars, there is no dollar interest showing up on the UI for community members who have contributed to that lending pool. So that's another reason why I say it appears to be broken. Mm, okay, this is, if you could report this um, uh, sort of more formally, Tebow, that would be helpful because I do see interest uh, uh, through the UI. Um, so we may be seeing different things. Okay. Um, I guess I had reported it and uh, CEK had mentioned that there was some kind of issue going on with it with respect to me. I don't know why my UI is showing that. Um, I don't know if CEK could um, speak to it. Or... CEK isn't on this call, but Spro, perhaps you know more about this? CEK on the call. Oh, really? Oh, yes. CK, maybe you can comment then. Hi, guys. Um, the issue that what you were experiencing is that you were not able to withdraw uh, the liquidity, but the interest uh, are occurred and distributed, distributed uh, whenever there is borrowing activity or someone repays a uh, base interest basically so maybe that could just have been a temporary issue uh, dm me and i will take a, a closer look please will do um so I also would just like to see that that dollar lending pool. I, I mean, right now we have a little over four thousand dollars in there. There is no reason why we shouldn't have, you know, um, you have USDT with five hundred thousand in there. You have XUSD with over a million dollars in there, and USDT can't even be borrowed on the borrowing page. So. I would assume that all that borrowing is being um, done by the protocol, whether through, I guess, um, trading or margin or something. But I don't know why we aren't, you know, first um, incentivizing us to be doing all that with dollar as opposed to USDT and XUSD. If dollar is our stable coin, then why are we not promoting it? Um, yes, I think that's a good point. Um, the, I think, um, the way I would think about this is we are in a process now where we are transitioning the protocol to using sovereign dollar as the primary stable asset. Uh, this cannot be done right or easily, right? So we have um, a legacy system which used XUSD, which is USDT. Um, it has positions which um, are still held via margin trading, for example, which used XUSDT, sorry, XUSD and USDT as the borrowing asset. Now, um, because this is a permissionless system, switching those over is not a trivial uh, effort. And um, there is, and this is part of the work that we need to do in order to set the system up for further growing the sovereign dollar, right? So uh, on the roadmap, we want to um, complete D2. We want to integrate um, the bridges. We want to, um, transition the margin trading positions over to using um, uh, sovereign dollar. Uh, we want the lending uh, uh, UI to better reflect and, and emphasize sovereign dollar, both in terms of borrowing and lending. And so this requires uh, 
the introduction of uh, lending and borrowing on D2. Um, and this is work that will uh, be accomplished over the coming two, three, four months. Um, and so we are in the process of making that transition. Promoting it, um, I think, need, is a stepwise process. So first we need to have the system properly uh, constructed to promote this, right, from a technical perspective. And then it becomes more logical and easier to promote it from an education and communications perspective. So um, the idea here is to pause the the sovereign dollar as we're putting, sorry, to pause zero as we're putting these things into place. Um, one other comment I'll make on this. Our overall strategy has been to, on an iterative basis, introduce uh, products and um, we were, we and have been aware that, you know, we're not always... If you are uh, not talking, please uh, mute yourself. Otherwise, you will be server muted. All right. So um, the way that we introduce changes to the system is we don't wait to introduce everything when it's perfect if we would if we did that we would still not have launched sovereign right so we intro we, we we have a, a policy of launching and introducing products even when the entire protocol or the ui or not everything is perfectly matched uh, sequentially um, and i think this is a is exactly the way we should be going about things it allows us to get into market it allows us to ship fast. It allows us to iterate. But as a result, we sometimes have imbalances uh, introduced, and we're currently experiencing one of them. So I understand that, you know, this is a stepwise process, and like I've always said, I think the team is doing, um, you know, an amazing job and, you know, with the new DAP and, and everything. Um, I am a little bit concerned when we talk about a thousand percent origination fee. The whole name of zero suggests that it's zero percent interest. And I've seen that and heard that many times, many places. So. It may be necessary. I'm not saying that it is necessary. I don't know. But I wonder if that wouldn't damage the reputation of the protocol, saying that it's 0% interest, and in reality, we have at 1,000% interest. I'd like to allow someone else to comment, either agreeing with... Uh, um, T-bone or, um, you know, making the counter argument because otherwise it's sort of just me uh, conversing, which is what I, I you know, it's not, not, this, not the purpose of this call. I think something else that I think a lot about with zero, and this is Travis, is, um, is this always going to be a problem? Do we always see something like this happening where we have to constantly monitor between the originations and the redemptions for our users even if we have uh, a much deeper liquidity pool in the future or do we think that this may change are we looking more at just where liquidity is at or liquidity is right now and comparing ourselves to them or if this is something that eventually we'll be able to grow out of and we could potentially be back at you know, where we used to be before on redemptions of like 150% over collateralized or 120 or whatever that was. I will uh, take a stab at answering both questions. Um, so with regards to T-Bone's question about interest, um, 
there is there is still no interest in in zero. Um, an interest rate implies there is an ongoing cost to maintaining a loan, um, and that cost grows over time. Uh, and and even if even with origination fee at a thousand percent, that is still not the case. It's a one time cost, um, and there's no additional cost incurred for maintaining the line of credit. Um, that said, uh, we're not actually expecting anybody to pay a thousand percent origination fee. We're expecting this to result in no or extremely low uh, borrowing volume, just because it's a prohibitively an intentionally prohibitively high cost. Uh, um, but uh, even still, for everybody who opens a line of credit or has an existing line of credit, there's still no interest. So 0% uh, interest is still very much a um, honest and, and accurate claim. Um, with regards to the question about um, whether this is something that we're constantly going to have to be dealing with, um, I think that um, the protocol should always be monitored by SOV stakers so that they um, are, you know, continue to be um, good stewards of the protocol, being that it is under their governance. Um, and, you know, should the need arise, um, you know, I, I would hope that SOV stakers continue to make um, intelligent proposals to mitigate uh, risks and uh, other kinds of negative uh, effects or experiences um, for users of the protocol. Uh, with that having been said, I just because due to the nature of this particular problem it is the case that as liquidity for the sovereign dollar increases there will be fewer redemptions it's just uh the redemptions are caused by a lack of liquidity um so you if you address that problem you address the root cause of the redemption uh the reason for redemptions. Um, and so, you know, instead of using redemptions as like a, a way to basically cash out sovereign dollars, uh, more liquidity would mean that people can, you know, use the AMM or use bridges or use um, Babelfish or what have you, different, uh, different ways of, of cashing out their sovereign dollars. Um, without having to use the redemption facility. Um, so it's, like I said, it's it's not something that, you know, we, once there's liquidity, we, you know, don't have to look at it again. It's something that, you know, SOV stakers should, should be constantly monitoring and, and tweaking as needed. But again, just due to the, exact nature of, of the problem at hand, uh, I do think it would be the case that we would see uh, less of a need uh, to adjust the origination fee rate or the redemption fee rate as we have for the past several months, um, and that you know such adjustments would happen less frequently. <clears throat> um, and if anything, you know, we'll be able to reduce the redemption fee rate and and uh, origination fee rates as liquidity as the liquidity situation improves and maybe leave it alone for a while uh, maybe I'd like <clears throat> go ahead I'd like to add to that we are at the very early days of the sovereign dollar um, and if you look at the history of other stable coins uh, they, especially in the early days, went through periods of violent volatility or hard caps. So, for example, USDT in its earliest period significantly lost its peg several times, uh, more dramatically than the sovereign dollar ever has. Um, similar things happened with um, uh, DAI. In addition to that, for the first year of DAI's existence, um, there were hard limits on the amount of DAI 
that would be issued and how and hard limits on how much people could borrow uh, using CDPs using DAI. Uh, this makes sense because as you're um, growing, this, this is not like a, a speculative token. This is a this is a, a currency, and um, you need to you need time. Uh, to grow the ecosystem of the currency. Now, when you look at the same stable coins in their more mature state, they still have significant fluctuations in um, the amount of value held in them, depending on uh, market rates. You know, uh, the, the the amount of USDT circulating can fluctuate by many billions of dollars. So there will never be a situation where no redemptions occur at all. However, um, when you have a very large monetary base, then um, the fluctuations occur on the margin and the system works as expected, which is to say that those relatively undercapitalized lines of credit would be the ones being redeemed. You also have market, um, uh, you have markets which uh, modulate the demand beyond just the redemption and origination fee. So. For example, incentive curves uh, on Babelfish or deeper liquidity around um, trading in AMM. Um, so there's certainly a um, qualitative change in the behavior of, of a stablecoin that occurs as a result of a quantitative change in the amount of stablecoin that is circulating. Uh, and the simplest way to think about this is as the capital base of sovereign dollar grows, then the, any given redemption um, represents a smaller percentage of that entire capital base. So, uh, sure, we will probably see larger amounts of redemptions as the capital base grows, but they're still likely to be a much smaller percentage of the total uh, amount of funds held in lines of credit. and there'll be the possibility for people to have, to, to more easily express um, their appetite for risk. Right now, everyone is effectively forced to hold very, very high collateral uh, lines of credit, uh, which is, you know, rather than a, the distribution that we would want to see and saw at the beginning where there were extremely risky lines of credit and less risky lines of credit. So yes, uh, uh, quantity here has a quality all its own. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, allow another few seconds for anyone who would like to ask questions or comment. And if not, um, I will attempt to summarize. I think there was a question by Lactarius um, in the chat, if, uh, if you want to address that. Yes, uh, I read the question in the forum, but haven't had time to respond. Uh, so Iktarius asks, how will... Um, Iktarius says that it, based on his understanding, it was the increase in the redemption fee which reduced redemptions, uh, not the increase in the origination fee. Um, and then he goes on to say, perhaps the idea that there, are, that there would be no new lines of credit issued and then redemptions would gradually reduce. Uh, I think that is the point, but um, more to the point, the reason redemptions occur is because people don't have a more um, convenient way of trading out of sovereign dollars when they want to. And this is um, due to one of two things. One, because the price of the sovereign dollar is um, trading lower than par. And that could be because someone comes, creates a new line of credit, issues into existence sovereign dollars, and the first thing they do is they go and they sell those sovereign dollars for Bitcoin, right? So that will reduce the relative value of the sovereign dollar because it creates sell pressure. The other aspect is that as new sovereign dollars are issued into existence, they need to find a home. So 
in the steady state, right? The sovereign dollars that are current, for example, the sovereign dollars that are currently in existence, all of them have a home, right? We know they have a home because they have to be somewhere, which is they're in someone's wallet, they're in the lending pool, they're in the AMM. Um, new sovereign dollars have to find a home. And so uh, until we're creating more homes, we shouldn't be uh, inviting more sovereign dollars, right? So in a way, you can think about it as analogous to, you know, an immigration problem. You don't want a lot of new immigrants to come to your city if you don't have homes for them because they'll become homeless. So we don't want homeless sovereign dollars. And that is what would likely reduce the likelihood of redemptions. Okay, um, I'd like to briefly summarize and bring this call uh, to a close. It is my intention to bring uh, this SIP to vote tomorrow. Uh, this is at an accelerated pace, and it is um, because I don't think it would be healthy for us to have a scenario where there is a long period of uncertainty where people are trying to create new lines of credit to take advantage of a gap in the market. I also think that this discussion is one which isn't new. Um, and so while the SIP will be accelerated, the conversation has been had for many months and I think is well understood. Beyond that, I think it's important to recognize that this is a step back, right? Uh, we would like to uh, keep zero pumping, uh, but it is one which is um, specifically designed in order to facilitate growth uh, in, the, in the future. Um, we should be thinking here how we set ourselves up to significantly grow zero and significantly grow the sovereign dollar. And there is a huge amount of work, uh, all of which necessary. So there's a lot of little pieces, no civil bullet here, and we need to provide time for that work to happen. We need to provide time for uh, companies to play with it and test it. We need to provide time for people to enter the market and acquire sovereign dollars um, so that we can begin to see that growth. I think it's also important to note that this is exactly the pattern that every single successful stablecoin has followed. Um, and so it is not surprising and I don't think it should be surprising to us. Um, so I will be presenting this up and I hope you guys will uh, see fit to vote in favor. Um, I recognize it's not the most exciting SIP because we usually want to vote in favor of things that have immediate uh, good news and, and growth uh, associated with them. Whereas this is a SIP around taking a pause for a moment and consolidating. That pause and consolidating is, um, is natural, is important, and I hope you guys will vote in favor. Um, and so I, with that, unless someone, someone else would like to have the last word, I will uh, bring this call to a close. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation and the discussion. Um, and I, uh, I encourage all of you, whether you agree with the SIP or not, to participate. Thank you very much. Stay sovereign.